Do you have a PowerPoint? Yeah, or, I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. How okay. does that work here? Are you doing the PowerPoint? I, I yeah. think Tony needed to know. Okay. Tony, he has a PowerPoint. I don't know. If Tony, is it impossible to put stuff up there from my computer? Later, okay. yeah. At the, yeah Good the morning, session. everyone. Welcome to our uh, final panel before we do our workshops today on creative activism for the earth and peace. I'm Alice Slater. I'm on the coordinating committee of World Beyond War. I live in New York. I do a lot of work at the United Nations with the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. I'm working to shut down our nuclear power plant and uh, peace and the environment has always been integrated in my life. Um, we have a wonderful panel and uh, I, before I introduce them though, I just want to acknowledge Dale Dewar yesterday who mentioned that this is the indigenous land of the Pasquati and the Anacostia. And I've learned in the meetings that I've been doing that it would be great to have some indigenous welcome at the meeting and since we didn't really prepare for it this time and I hope you will the next time in Washington when you're here. Yeah. I, I'd like to read a statement from the Lenape who are the indigenous people of New York that they made on the occasion of the non-proliferation treaty meeting at uh, the UN in New York for our Abolition 2000 meeting. It's so apropos. It says, uh, welcome to the land of the Lenape. Mother Earth has provided for us everything we need to experience life since the beginning of time. This generosity has been abused by the addiction of profit and her body deemed a commodity. We have prostituted our life-giving mother to our greed. Our vicious lust of profit has caused great injury to her body a body that sustains us. Climate change is the symptom. Global warming is her fever. And the disease is greed. Had we kept a relationship of honor and respect with the Earth, we would not be in this climate change predicament, nor would be, we be here today to speak of peace and disarmament. The root cause of climate change, the weapons race, nuclear proliferation, and the military-industrial complex are one. Humans have lost their natural calibration to the life-giving cycles of our planet. Heart, consciousness, compassion, balance have ceased to be spun into life and into renewal. Humans no longer feel an obligation to honor Earth's true role as the life-giver and respectfully follow her natural cycles. The overwhelming obligation is now profit at all costs. Welcome to Lenape Hoking and into a call for a new cycle of consciousness. Very nice. And now I'd like to introduce our wonderful panel uh, in the order that they'll be speaking. Uh, Brian Troutman, to my left, is the treasurer of Veterans of Peace and a lifetime member of the organization. He's a U.S. Army veteran, having served on active duty as a cannon crew member from 1993 to 1997. Brian has been employed in various administrative and faculty positions in higher education over two decades, including as an instructor of peace studies and economics at a community college since 2008. He is on the steering committee of his local peace group, Berkshire Citizens of Peace and Justice. Brian became involved with the peace and justice moving during the lead up to the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and was recently appointed to the board of the newly formed standing committee for the Americas of the World Veterans Federation. His interests as a peace scholar practitioner include peace education, counter hegemonic struggles, Eco-socialism, indigenous knowledge systems, and intersectional social justice. Great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> is this mic working? Okay, it sounds like it is. Thank you, Alice, for that introduction. I'd also like to uh, welcome all of you and say good morning, and thank uh, David Swanson, Leah Bolger, and World Beyond War for hosting us here uh, this weekend. Um, 
my remarks will be rather brief. I think the panel agreed to keep it about 10 minutes each, um, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A and have an interactive session uh, with, uh, with all of you. Um, the uh, subject of this panel, this session today, is creative activism. Um, so I hope I live up to that uh, title and expectation um, uh, through my remarks. Um, but first, I would like to read a poem by Teresa May Chuck, which was reprinted in uh, Veterans for Peace's Full Disclosure newspaper, which provides personal accounts of the truth about America's war in Vietnam. This poem reflects much of what has been discussed at this conference over this weekend so far concerning the environmental costs and consequences and ecological harm of war. Um, Teresa May Chuck, also known as Tu Mai Chuck, um, was born in Saigon, Vietnam, shortly after the horrendous war that bombed her people and her homeland. She and her family survived, although her parents were separated for a long time. Chuck and her brother and her mother escaped Vietnam in a ship crowded with hungry, sick, and frightened immigrants. Under political asylum, they settled in California where eventually they reunited with her father who had spent nine years in a Viet Cong re-education camp. Chuck writes about war and her personal and family history out of her uh, personal history beyond her cultural heritage and apart from her family, Chuck finds her own individuality in her poems. The poem is entitled, The Decade the Rainforest Died. The Decade the Rainforest Died by Teresa May Chuck. The deer did not stop running. Leopards climbed into trees that could not hide them. The Duke Langer and the white-cheeked gibbon cursed at the metal gods. We flew raining on them as they burned from napalm. Elephants choked on the smoke of gunpowder and poison, their steps a strange rhythm as they tried to fly. The thunder of bombs echoed the steps of elephants. Tigers exploded as they stepped onto landmines. In, in a forest covered with leaves, dead from Agent Orange. Fallen trees and decomposing bodies of animals and people, the earthworms were washed away in monsoons with soil that could no longer grab onto roots. The Javan rhinoceros and the wild water buffaloes that were still alive wandered aimlessly. And weary with M16s and AK-47s, we marched quietly and steadily, not knowing why we were killing each other. Now, the, um, the poem, again, is reprinted in our full disclosure newspaper, Veterans for Peace, um, as well uh, as our quarterly newspaper, Peace in Our Times, are available on the table outside, the Veterans for Peace table. Um, so feel, feel free after our session to grab a copy. Or two or three, yes. <laughs> we have plenty. And a donation, of course, would be appreciated. <laughs> um, while it's true that many people contemplate the human costs of war from PTSD and TBI to veteran suicide, the outrageous ecological damage of war is not something given a great deal of serious thought and attention, comparatively speaking. Present company excluded, of course. Most, if not all, of us here today have at least some level of knowledge and understanding that Mother Nature has been the victim of war and militarism since the beginnings of recorded history. Especially now, perhaps more than ever, after two days at this landmark and momentous conference, we have a, a bet much better understanding of, of the effects and consequences. Only in this century, however, has the effects of war and militarism been multiplied many times over, given advancements in military technology of modern warfare including the manufacturing and use of weapons of mass destruction over the past century. So in the few moments I have today in my opening remarks, I won't rehash some of the most egregious attacks on our environmental and ecological systems by the war machine. Um, as I said, this conference has already done a remarkable job of that task through our various sessions over the past two days. I will say, however, that a huge and obvious opportunity cost of waging war is that instead of working for a more sustainable future, our tax dollars continue to be spent on human death and environmental destruction at the expense of all of us, particularly future generations. 
Money spent on endless war is money not spent reducing our dependence on fossil fuels or supporting the transition to a low carbon economy. We have a current plan in place um, that was uh, installed at, during the Obama administration of uh, $1 trillion in upgrades, modernization to U.S. nuclear weapons program over the next 30 years. And of course, we have a growing and bloated military budget that will continue to take taxpayer revenue away from the development of renewable energy technologies and limit spending on programs to reduce insecurity caused by climate change. Again, I'll skip discussing the effects of environmental um, war, uh, the, the fa environmental effects of war, excuse me, such as that which has been uh, caused by Agent Orange, depleted uranium, fossil fuel extraction, and nuclear waste. However, I will add a direct personal experience of contributing to this degradation during my time in the military. Stationed entirely domestically prior to 9-11, I witnessed and at times was a participant in various forms of environmental destruction on behalf of the military industrial complex. Some of these included the laying of Constantine wire, which was used to secure perimeters during training exercises. I witnessed wild horses and other animals getting caught and ripped to shreds by this wire out in the field. We would discover them um, in the morning. Um, they would, of course, be uh, dead, perished, uh, those animals. And many times, we, we wouldn't give it a second thought. We would simply um, do our best to, to, cover, to cover up those animals. Um, I would also add that we had a number of uh, diesel fuel spills while I was out on training exercises um, when refueling and also leaks from the vehicles that caused obvious harm to, uh, to ecological systems. The uh, firing of small arms, and as Alice mentioned during my introduction, I was a cannon crew member, so we fired artillery rounds uh, from our tanks, our howitzers, into the backwoods of Oklahoma, Georgia, Alaska, Louisiana, California, <laughs> uh, frequently with no idea where these rounds were, were headed, were going, where they landed. Um, and of course, there's also the human biological waste and other waste um, that while we were out in these training exercises, we buried in, in the backwoods of wherever we were. So those are just a few examples of how uh, I contributed to e uh, ecological destruction while I, was, while I was in the military. Creative activism, now that I have two minutes left, I see. <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna go very quickly through uh, some of the work that uh, that I recommend, I suggest, ideas that I'll put out there for all of you to consider, and of course during our Q&A, um, we could certainly follow up on those ideas and you could offer your own. Let's see, skipping ahead. Okay. So what we are advocating for here in our creative activism is an intersectional systems-based approach to tackling violence and oppression, and achieving peace and social and ecological justice. Veterans for Peace has been speaking out on these issues for many years. We are committed to exposing the uh, costs of war and militarism, the human and environmental costs. So there's been educative and more formal standard tools available to us uh, for activism, uh, declarations, conventions, protocols of sort that we can use as a tool. These include the International Day for Preventing the Exploitation of the Environment in War and Armed Conflict, the 1992 Rio Declaration, and then there's the Earth Charter, which I've been studying for many years. I, I in fact, started my dissertation focused on uh, the Earth Charter as, as the theme. Um, I won't go into exactly what the Earth Charter is right now, uh, given time. But I would suggest that we focus also our community efforts and activism around our local media centers. Um, that many times support social justice and environmental causes. One example I would give is the Sanctuary for Independent Media in Troy, New York. It's located in a historic church. I've been volunteering with this organization since near uh, their founding 10 years ago. It's a place um, that, and I quote, they use art and participatory action to promote social and environmental justice and freedom of creative expression. 
It's a hub for creative resistance, a, plant, a place where community-engaged, interdisciplinary artists experiment with aesthetic form and challenging content with the overarching goal of shedding light on media arts and social justice to build a democratic society. Um, I would also offer up, uh, without going into a great deal of explanation and examples, Peace Cafes start. Uh, Peace Cafe participated at a Peace Cafe. These are located largely in Canada and uh, in Europe, but um, I would cer certainly offer the idea of, of starting Peace Cafes here. Bus Boys and Poets is probably the most well known, but it's, it's, it's uh, large and uh, many times not, not accessible to um, all groups at all the time. Uh, I'm talking more about community-based Peace Cafes. Okay, I'll, I'll, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker will be Bill Moyer, who co-founded the Backbone Campaign in 2003 with friends from an artist affinity group. He has dual and intersecting paths as both an activist and artist. His involvement with social change work stretches back to the 80s, when as a student he was deeply involved in the anti-nuclear movement and the anti-interventionist movement. After a few years of studying political science and American philosophy at Seattle University, Bill went to Big Mountain to assist Diné elders refusing to relocate off their traditional land, attended the Institute for Social Ecology, and briefly lived on an organic vegetable farm in Vermont. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, friends. Is this working? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. So yeah, uh, briefly, uh, th very, thank you very much to David Swanson and Leah and all the folks who put this together. Uh, I think the aspiration of, of joining movements is, uh, is laudable and appropriate. And I would just uh, posit that the, <clears throat> possibly what we're actually creating is a, a, an anti, or what we're all part of is an anti-extinction movement. That's and that's not a joke. So, uh, you know, Backbone started 14 years ago, to, and the idea was to replace the metaphor of weak need and bleeding heart with strong principled progressive that was breaking out of the issue silos, that was embracing intersectionality before we were even using that word. Uh, but I had a personal experience uh, 25 years ago that for me, really anchors the, uh, the metaphor. I was, uh, uh, or grounds it in a way. I was climbing a tree. Has anybody else climbed trees here? All right. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. I can relate to that. Three points of contact. That's what I'm going to say. Uh, I, if you only remember one thing from this whole weekend, three points of contact. Um, so uh, anyway, I was climbing up in this tree and I was watching the birds flitter and flit, you know, it's all beautiful. And I'm like, ah, uh, you know, nature's beautiful. I'm part of nature. I'm beautiful. We're all beautiful. And then I was like, oh, it's time to go to home, you know. So I stepped down and the branch broke under my foot and I lost my grip and I fell backwards. And I was 60 feet up in the air. And so, but all I had the time to think of in that trip down was, um, this could be it. I hit the ground, my arms, I was like, whoa, I'm not dead, I don't think. My arms aren't broken, my legs aren't broken. But then I tried to get up. And I had shattered T12, L1 and 2, three vertebrae. And, um, and I couldn't get up. Right? I had this aspiration, this idea of getting up, but I didn't have the capacity to manifest that idea in my reality, in my world. And for me, that's the fundamental lesson of the last 14 years, is that we may have all the great ideas in the world, but unless we have the social movement, we, we, will, we will lack the capacity to manifest those ideas. So. What in the heck is this social movement about, you know? And Backbone Campaign has tried to identify some of these things. Um, but fundamentally, I think it's, it's about rejecting a paradigm that puts everything for sale 
and says, no, nothing of actual importance is for sale. And in that, in its, in its, and movement building is, is fundamentally relational and, it, and appealing to the deep creativity and, um, and genius in all of us. And I found in the work, in the struggles that we've been part of, that the, um, the more we can identify with what people love, uh, the more we win. But this, the battle that we're in is a, is, is a battle. And, um, and there's a, uh, it's a battle of paradigms. And, I th and it's not okay to just say, oh, we want peace, say that's the vision, and so we're gonna have a march, and that's the tactic. That's never gonna get us to peace, sadly, right? We have to have far more power to manifest the vision for peace in our world, and that's gonna take a lot more movement building uh, that creates strategies for reaching goals of what kind of society could actually enforce peace. So in this battle of paradigms, I like to really be clear about what's, what's the opponent. And I dig back into my philosophy 101 roots of, in our American philosophy, this Max Weber and the spirit of capitalism, where this idea that the, the, there are the elect and there are the chosen and the, their, their station in life is a sign that you're predestined to salvation. That's, that's really the, the religion of this, that's the national religion. And capitalism, I would say, is a religion, not just an economic system, and its sacrament is inequality. Because in a system where elect, where you're proving that you're more have station, that you're more favored than the other, then you can't actually have a system that creates equity and equality. So you get a system that creates corporate rights, investor rights, rights of transnational capital. Really crazy shit. So um, can we read this together? This is our mission statement. Okay. With heart, please. <laughs> we, the corporations, transcending the boundaries of nations, in order to protect us from the people, ensure our right to extract and exploit, provide the defense of profit with impunity, and secure the blessings of wealth and privilege for those who have it already. Do ordain and appropriate this Constitution of the United, of the United States. States of America. <laughs> Bravo. Uh, beautifully done. So what's the alternative? Where are we at with time, may I ask? How much time left? Two minutes? Excellent. So what's the alternative? What are we, what are we, what are we offering? Um, we're offering that th nothing of actual importance is actually for sale. That this idea of salvation that's been sold to us and is it woven into our society is, is is toxic. This, the, 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 the salvation in the most original sense, I offer that it's, it's actually just a sense of survival of a community in place over time. And if, uh, what do I got here? Thank you, but no thank you. All right. So our ethic is fundamentally, and our actions have to be built upon an ethic and uh, reflect the value system that we're all in this together. But we know that we're in this battle. These, these two paradigms are real and they're, they're, in, they're in a conflict. Does anybody know where we are in this picture? I'll give you, time is limited. We're at the gates of Mordor. And, um, and there's a hobbit going up the hill with a ring of power, but we don't have a hobbit with a ring of power, okay? <laughs> Um, and those, as far as I know. Anyway, and uh, those folks in the middle, they're screwed because they're trying to play the game of, they're not actually, they're buying time for the Hobbit, right? But, but they're screwed, right? They're all saying goodbye to each other because this is attrition warfare. You cannot win, we cannot win with attrition warfare. Our, the opposite paradigm has a monopoly on violence and money. Maneuver conflict. We can sometimes gain space in the society by temporary physical advantage or surprise. And we use our tactics to do that, to drop a banner on a building or, or on bridges or whatever, where we get out and we get to champion our values and our vision for the future um, in the public sphere. 
fundamentally, we are in a moral conflict. It's a conflict of, uh, and our, our, our power is based on our capacity to appeal to the hearts and minds, the deepest aspirations and values of the people in society. In Grand Strategy, and this is, comes from the Art of War and Colonel Boyd and Chuck Spinney, and these are mentors. My, a lot of my work has been to adapt these Art of War ideas to nonviolent social movement. But our fundamental task is to expand alliances, increase the cohesion of the, those relationships of allies, and to deepen the resolve of the people who are participating. We, can, we do the opposite too, but I'm not going to get into that. But it's really important that we draw people to our cause in a way that makes them feel that, they, they, that their life and the time that they spend with us um, and that, that we spend together is, um, reflects our truest aspirations. And that um, in a way we're decolonizing from the other paradigm, making room for, for something different. There's a concept from the art, uh, Colonel Boyd, it's called motherhood and mismatch. And it's just that we want our cause to be unattackable, to be an unassailable good. And we want to attack and avoid mismatches between who we say we are and who we actually, or let's take it the other way, let's take our opponent. We can, the mismatches are their vulnerabilities, are the differences between what they say they're doing and what they're actually doing. What they say is real and what people's experience of reality is and what they, uh, who they say they are and who they actually are. So we expose mismatches. We, you know, who would Jesus deport? We flew a banner over a detention center. Um, there's probably lots of examples of that. But motherhood is all about protecting what you love. And if you don't like the word motherhood because that's what they use, but an unassailable good. We have to make sure that our work is as close to an unassailable good as possible. So this is a kayak flotilla with a heart. It's just, and what I find about kayakivism and such is that it connects people to what they love. This is on the beaches, it's 200 people and umbrellas and such. Connecting to what people love, the aspiration of the we the people marching through the, in the Women's March in DC. That is, that's how we draw people in, by being so beautiful and, um, and resonating with, those, with this other paradigm and making space for that paradigm in our, all of our lives in this society. So we attack, we toxify. So this, this circle, so we're competing for this middle circle, the politically possible. Think of politics as the art of the possible and calculus as the mathematics of changing variables. So, um, so uh, we, uh, we attack, we, we don't ask politicians for favors. We change the social and so, the cultural and economic variables. We toxify their paradigm and we celebrate ours. So Backbone Campaign has done that for 14 years, but nine years of that is with action camps. This is kind of a, our latest one. I just, I, that you're not gonna hear them. They're saying, you know, localize this, woohoo! All right, but, lo okay. but localize, localization and relational organizing is, I believe, what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, Let's see if I can get to the next slide, all right. Backbone uses, has a prop library, so we invite you into collaboration using uh, our various props that we've been developing. Um, Solidarity Brigades, a network of tacticians who are learning how to use light projection and banners and other tactical tools. Um, and uh, kayaktivism to connect to place and the, you love. Uh, and. Uh, and also thinking about how do we invest in very hyper-local organizing, the idea of community-supported organizers. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, make other comments later. Thank you so much. If you want to hear more, there's a workshop on this with these people. I'm sorry that we're trying to save some time for the interaction. And now I'm going to call on our uh, third speaker, Nadine Block, who is currently training director for Beautiful Trouble. 
that's a website, and an innovative artist, nonviolent practitioner, political organizer, direct action trainer, and puppetista. Her work explores the potent intersection of art and politics where creative cultural resistance is not only effective political action, but also a powerful way to reclaim agency over our own lives, fight oppressive systems, and invest in our communities, all while having more fun than the other side. She's a contributor to Beautiful Trouble, and we are many reflections on movement strategy from occupation to liberation, and author of a special report, Education and Training in Nonviolent Resistance, and check out her column on the blog, Waging Nonviolence, the Arts of Protest. Thank you. So thank you all for showing up on a Sunday morning early. I think you all deserve a round of applause yourselves. So thank you for coming. Thank you for organizing this conference. It's good to be here. Um, I'm going to build on what uh, Alice, Brian, and Bill have said. I have been involved in this work since the early 1980s. And um, as you can see from Bill's slideshow, there are, and from what Brian mentioned, there are so many incredible tactics that we have all used in this work for creative activism for the planet and for peace and beyond, right? And the tactics are the sexy thing, the fun things, the really great way to hook people in. And that's why we talk about them so much, because they're so fun and so easy to focus on. But the true thing is about this is that without strategy, without putting the tactics into that pyramid of action, we very rarely get what we want out of our tactics. And as artists, as cultural workers, we sometimes have a great idea for something. We just want to go ahead and make that gilded painting or that giant puppet, which is one of the things that I do, uh, make giant puppets and march in the street and stilt walk and climb and make banners, all that stuff. But without the framework for that particular tactic within a strategy, it doesn't deliver. And so this is where I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about strategy today. So what does make a campaign successful? That's the big $64 billion question now, right? It always has been. What makes a campaign successful? So I want to take one minute, and I would like you to turn to somebody you're sitting next to or in front of or behind, and take a minute and answer that question off the top of your head. What is the key to a successful campaign? Ready? Go. You have a minute. Say hi. Talk to the person next to you. Oh, wow. <laughs> what do you think it is, Bill? What do you think? Communication. Yeah. I think that's key. Um, <laughs> consensus versus. I know there's no uh, answer. <laughs> full agreement on you know everybody's ideas. Uh, so consensus, communication, um, so commitment. Sad. The three C's. <laughs> consensus, like, communication, and commitment. But it's also like it has to be an idea. All right, we didn't have much time, but thank your neighbor, Absolutely. thank your partner, and you'll be able to continue this conversation in a minute. Okay, let's So if you can hear me, when I say people, you say power. People. People. Awesome. Thank you so much for participating in that. So it turns out, you know, as an activist committed to nonviolent social change, that one of the most important things around movement success is in fact adherence to nonviolent action. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not talking about uh, nonviolence as a moral or philosophical belief system or a way of living. I'm talking about strategic nonviolent action which allows you to not to work together as a community without resort to violent action to win your campaigns. And why is it that nonviolent action, in fact, we have data now from Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth's book 